We are half an hour away from the Wednesday opening bells in Hong Kong, Shanghai and Shenzhen. You're watching The China Show. I'm David Inglis. Let's get your top stories today. Traders are weighing mixed economic data and also these hawkish leaning comments coming out of Fed officials here for clues and really rate cut outlook. Uh, the, uh, we'll be breaking the latest Aussie inflation numbers, which are due this hour. Now, Goldman Sachs is dip buying opportunities in China's stock rallies. And despite the pullbacks we are seeing there, despite, of course, signs that the market is running, currently running out of good news. And following protests and sometimes intense debate, Taiwan passes laws that could curb the powers of new President Lai Jingde. Good morning and uh, again welcome to the program. We're going into the Wednesday session with really not a lot of tailwinds uh, coming through just about across asset groups here. So we'll start things off with the equity markets and the tone there is really uh, one of, well I mean price is down yes, volumes are not there so really not a lot of, conv not a lot of conviction as far as the downside is concerned. Uh, we have seen some consolidation around most of these benchmarks in the region. We'll talk about what we're seeing in mainland in particular in just a moment here. Hon Hai Precision, we're looking at that as we open things in Taiwan, following uh, data points on perhaps a better month, if that's a way to put it there, for, for iPhone shipments in China. Uh, where we are seeing a lot of conviction, though, is really these, you know, some of the declines in pressure we're seeing across the bond markets. It was a horrible day to be long treasuries overnight. We're flat and sideways on treasuries right now. The 30-year yield, of course, did see a massive pickup in, in, in yield. Uh, not the best two- or five-year auctions there, of course, and we are seeing these a melt-up in yields just about across the board with the uh, perhaps most pronounced moves we are seeing in the likes of Australia, for example. We're up 11 basis points, as you can see there, on the Aussie 10-year yield. Inflation is out in about 28 minutes from now. We'll break those to you uh, a bit later on in the show. Uh, the Golden Dragon Index up overnight, uh, up in fact for the first time uh, in six sessions here. So within this space, we're looking at some of these education-related names, New Oriental, for example. Uh, there's also separate news which might be related to the price that we saw overnight uh, from Xinhua President Xi Jinping talking about how youth unemployment is really the the priority of priorities this year. Uh, half of 1% as far as this is concerned here goes, goes into the open today and uh, more on this in a moment, but really an upgraded, minor upgrades uh, from private economists on the outlook for Chinese, uh, for the Chinese economy this year. We're looking at a flat to a slightly lower open here and, <clears throat> excuse me, dollar China as you can see at 726.63 going into the open today where the 3600 level as we're telling you right now bottom of your screens is really the level to watch which has been holding these last couple of days or so. Right. Now, we're looking at, I guess, perhaps day two here of the property measures here and maybe market reaction or the lack of it. Yesterday, going into the close yesterday, we sort of gave up a lot of the momentum mm -hmm. to the upside there. Um, so you have not just Shanghai, right? You have major cities now coming in, uh, easing these housing rules. Stephen Engel, of course, is our co-pilot <laughs> these next two hours or so. It's the Engel and Engel show, as they, as they say. Yeah. Uh, what more do we know about the property? Trademark story? that name now. Yeah. Uh, yeah, obviously, uh, there was a little bit of a petering out of that rally yesterday because a bit of an exhaustion on policy and job owning coming from mm -hmm. Beijing. Shermao, uh, the property developer that has properties in Beijing and Shanghai, mm -hmm. uh, it was up 16% at one point. It, it finally uh, closed up about 1.8%. So you saw that momentum. Momentum uh, lose steam, but again, we had a further clarification of some of these, uh, you know, easing of restrictions or the the res yeah the restrictions on home buying, such as down payment requirements and mortgages. Not only in Shanghai, which was the news yesterday, but also the two megalopolises in southern mm -hmm. China, uh, Shenzhen and Guangzhou, just across the border, right here out our window, obviously. Uh, so essentially, Guangzhou will lower the down payment requirements for first-time home buyers to as low as 15 percent mm -hmm. of the asking price. So 15% down can get you into an already falling, depreciated uh, uh, depreciating value uh, new home. So again, these are, are trying to encourage, uh, you know, p to put a floor on this property crisis in China. Yeah. So I guess now we wait. Now we wait. Now if we the wait. data turns and, and if really home buyers start to kick in, 
it's almost a chicken and egg really here when you look at home prices still falling and then people staying away. Uh, but as far as the, the outlook is concerned, as Steve was just pointing out there as well, right? So it's been enough, we have seen enough at least on the policy front for economists to start bumping up ever so slightly their forecast here for the Chinese economy. So our latest Bloomberg survey is out. This is for May and we're comparing April here, by the way. So as far as growth is concerned, as you can see, Steve, we've gone from 48 to 4.9 percent. Others are also seeing a slight pickup. But, you know, as we were, we've been talking about these last, what, six weeks or so, it's really in the consumption and retail sales that so far has been wanting. Yeah, the right. So, and, you know, I think in this forecast as well, we saw some more policy moves uh, being forecast, expecting the PBOC perhaps to cut the triple R requirement at banks by another 25 basis points by the end of June. Again, so there's there's monetary and fiscal support to this economy. Now we just need to get the consumer uh, enjoying uh, what has been a stabilization of the economy since January was was really bad. Yeah, there we go. Um, yeah, and certainly the, the the composition of growth now becomes a key part of the conversation, right? So we know exports are doing well. We know investment is coming in. We know these special bonds have been raising a lot of money and that's going to be eventually spent and really where the consumer goes now and how they really, I guess in many ways, take the money that's been parked in the bank, trillions of such, and really how they deploy that into the property market and also consumption here. So we're looking at property stocks and high yields specifically on the back of some of these uh, pronouncements, Shanghai included there. Uh, in the last, I think it was May 23, May 24, uh, where, where Chinese President Xi Jinping, he was in, he was in Shandong and actually came out with uh, uh, effectively some of the reforms around the power, uh, power industry. And we have seen since that point in time, utility stocks have not looked back. We're looking at that. Earnings, of course, coming through as well. And, of course, a Taiwan office uh, uh, briefing, affairs office briefing, of course, also within the next, what, three hours or so. That takes us into the market conversation now. And have we seen enough... Uh, for, I guess, long-only funds, because certainly hedge funds have jumped into this market, long-only funds, um, th to look at this Chinese equity market as something, what is the word, beyond tactical? Let's put that question to Ian Sampson, a multi-asset portfolio manager at Fidelity. He joins us out of Singapore. Ian, good, good morning, and, and thanks for making time for us. We'll talk about the other, I guess, facets of her portfolio in a moment. I want to start with China, if that's okay. Just your thoughts, we're 30% into the rally, 10 weeks in, give or take. How are you thinking about exposure at this point in, in the rally, Ian? Sure, we're quite a long way into the rally, but that's after a horrendous bear market. So the way I think about it is the, the headwinds for China are, are very well known, demographics, property, frankly, the lack of a, a policy narrative for investors to really get excited about. But if I look at, at some of the segments of the market, take um, even the, uh, the consumer intranet part, despite the, the sort of pessimism on the China consumer, you've seen some really decent earnings numbers and earnings momentum. Um, and if I look at some of the, the best indicators of, of domestic demand, for instance, imports, import growth year on year last month was the strongest it had been for, for two years. So there's signs that um, the fundamentals are turning a little bit more supportive. And when you look at some of these names and see that a couple of years out, they could be on single digit PEs in a, in a global context where stocks are very expensive, it does seem like there's a place from a long only perspective to, to start looking um, at China from, from an overweight perspective. Ian, this is Steve Engel. Let me jump in. Is the excitement and the exuberance sort of petering out, though? We've seen uh, the markets kind of trade flat in China uh, throughout May, even though it's up about 12 percent since February 1st, of course, on a lot of uh, positive moves on the fiscal front, uh, possibly on monetary front, and, and just essentially the property market uh, as they try to put a floor on that. But again, uh, the CSI 300 is flat in May, and in Hong Kong, it's down five out of the last six sessions. So it's also, you know, just eking out very little gain in May. Have we lost steam or do you buy the dip? Look, these are, these have become very volatile uh, parts of the equity market as, as markets have struggled to find a valuation anchor. And so it's not a surprise after a really strong run up to see a bit of, of a give back. But I do think it's potentially a, an opportunity to, to add a little bit more on dips. You wouldn't want to, to bet the farm. But if earnings continue to, to come through in some of these preferred names, then markets should uh, find its feet again. 
Uh, yeah, so Ian, on that point, what, what specifically... Well, what spe 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 specific... Oh, I'm trying to get my words out. Specifically, uh, do you own in China right now, and how do you see that changing? <laughs> so, currently, we prefer to own the, the offshore and more consumer internet names. It's just a bit easier okay. to, to kind of get the, the story there. There is, of course, you know, a lot of potential in the, in the onshore market, but it feels you have to be a little bit more selective there, and, and I'm an asset allocator rather than, rather than a stock picker. And, of course, there's the, the concerns that with all the money being um, channeled into to kind of the, the industrial favorites by by the policymakers, which on one hand is a good thing, but it can also be a recipe for for low profits and um, mm. and over capacity. So that's why I'm preferring to to stick a little bit closer to uh, to what's kind of known to to the offshore investors. Those. Uh, internet right. names, you know, Meituan, PDD. Um, not that we'd pick anything specifically, but you can allocate broadly to the, you know, Hang Seng right. Tech Index. Yeah. Ian, how should we be looking at currencies right now in the renminbi and the U.S. dollar? Mm -hmm. You advocate sort of a carry trade there. Uh, again, we're going to talk about the Fed in a little bit, but again, you believe you know higher for longer from the Fed. Does that equate to a king dollar that will continue? And how does that relate to the renminbi? Yeah, we believe in, in higher for longer. If you look at where inflation is in the U.S., services inflation, services CPI inflation has been annualizing about 6% over the last six months. You know, the economy is clearly doing pretty well. There's no strong reason for the Federal Reserve to, to ease policies significantly. And so when you've got... The five percent or so yield on on the U.S. dollar and something in the the range of two percent on the renminbi on a very stable currency cross. That's an attractive an attractive trade, and it's one reason we stay long dollar versus renminbi. It's also a good portfolio hedge with the dollar continuing to to rally whenever you see wobbles in markets. Um, and given that you can't rely on say U.S. Treasuries to protect you in the way that you you, you used to, uh, we believe that the dollar is is the place to be overweight. Right, and just broadly there, Ian, do you think the, the, the carry conversation is something that we can trust still looking at the second half? Because that's been fairly consistent uh, in the last couple of months. Absolutely. I mean, the, the carry to volatility ratios, which is a, a key thing to monitor, kind of across currency pairs, uh, whether it's um, mm. within Asia, you know, India and Indonesian uh, rupee and rupiah, whether it's in Latin America, these high carry currencies relative to their volatility are, are continuing to look really quite attractive. And also you can, um, you can position yourself, again, to be kind of have a long dollar bias while being positive carry. So getting carry while being defensive. And so I think that's the reason why this trade is, is going to continue into the second half of the year. All right, Ian, uh, we'll talk more about that and we'll unpack some of your other ideas as well across other assets. In a moment, Ian Sampson there joins us out of, well, rejoins us, of course, out of, out of uh, Singapore in a moment there. Just ahead here on shows, though, just a preview too. Uh, see, Hong Kong police arresting six people using the city's new securities laws for the first time. So details in that story later this hour. Also counting down to the open of trade here in Hong Kong, in Shanghai and in Shenzhen. We're just approaching, what, 16? Minutes away to the opening bell. Futures are pointing lower going into this Wednesday session. Hope you're all well. Good morning, by the way, and thanks for joining us. This is The China Show. I've been asked many times, would we take potential interest rate increases off the table? I don't think anybody has formally taken them off the table, even, even me. Uh, I say that we could sit here for as long as necessary until we get convinced that inflation is sustainably going back down to our 2% target. I'm not ruling out potential interest rate increases from here, but I think sitting where we are for an extended period of time is a more likely outcome. But of course, if we get surprised by the data, then we would do what we need to do. And that was Neil Kashkari there out of the Minneapolis Fed, just reminding us really of the messaging coming out of not just him, and, but his other peers, of course, at the Fed that, you know what, those rate cuts, 
might not be coming anytime soon. The RMB fix of the day is out. Maybe they're adjusting to the strong dollar story. We're back. We now have again a 7 Eleven handle there on the midpoint of the session here. We're coming up data, an unexpectedly strong data, by the way, coming out of the U.S. Plus, of course, you have to couple this with those uh, the softer two and five year auctions out in the Treasury market. So, what you're seeing is yields effectively the price action iteration of all of that that I just mentioned pushing through as well. Um, unexpectedly up as far as U.S. consumer confidence concerned, topping all forecasts. And then on top of this, this, this yield picture across Japan, where 10-year yields in Japan at 107, that's a new 2011 high. Let's bring in Ian Sampson, who rejoins us out of, out of Singapore, multi-asset portfolio manager at Fidelity International. Ian, do I have any business at all being in the bond markets, given what we just laid out there? Uh, it's, it's hard to make a strong case for it. You know, you've got inflation in the U.S. really uh, much stronger than, than the Fed would like to see. Probably higher for longer interest rates. You know, markets are pricing in one, maybe two this year. There's a possibility of zero. But most fundamentally for me as a multi-asset portfolio manager, uh, these U.S. Treasuries not only are they yielding less than cash, but they're not protecting my portfolio. You know, bond yields are, are rising at the same time as, as stocks uh, softening. So we kind of look elsewhere for, for what we're doing with our, our bond portfolio, uh, looking at some emerging market local rates where at least you're getting paid a pretty nice carry, uh, waiting for, for interest mm -hmm. rates to come down. But it's hard to make a compelling case to be overweight U.S. Treasuries at this point. Right. Now, just on fixed income here, so my producer just laid out some notes that you've sent through. You're saying replace duration with U.S. dollar and options. Now, I understand that, but that's Greek and Martian maybe to, to, to some of our viewers. What does it exactly mean, Ian? <laughs> replace duration with U.S. dollar and options. Look, so if we think back to uh, pre-pandemic, the, the two or three decades before that, to protect your, your equity portfolio or your multi-asset portfolio, all you had to do was buy U.S. Treasuries or, or German bonds, and you'd get paid a, a positive yield. And when equities mm. sold off, uh, your bonds would rally and protect the portfolio. That's just not what you're seeing now in this more inflationary world, um, because equities are worried about inflation and bonds are worried about inflation when markets go down. They're not protecting you. So where can we look for, for protection? One place is the US dollar, where you're getting a higher yield than, than the euro, than the Aussie dollar, than the Swedish kroner, than the RMB. Um, and on days when markets go down, the dollar strengthens. So that's a positive carry way to protect your portfolio. On the other hand, you can use options markets, things like um, simple puts on the S&P, which are historically really, really cheap right now because markets uh, aren't that volatile, aren't that worried, to, to start to buy some, some cheap uh, protection on your portfolios. Ian, we just saw on the screen there the yen at 157 and change to the dollar. What's mm. your view on that, given uh, your outlook that the dollar, the king dollar, will continue? I mean, kind of the conviction trade across Asia in the beginning part of this year is that eventually, with the BOJ going on a tightening uh, run, if it will, uh, the yen will, will start gaining some traction, but it hasn't at all. There's been intervention. It hit 160 and pulled back only slightly. Is 157 in the cards for quite some time? I think the reason why you're struggling to see the yen rally is is quite simply that yield differential that isn't going anywhere. So even if the yen does rally significantly, um, you're going to lose about 5% just on that negative carry versus the dollar over a year. So it's hard um, to really structurally buy back in uh, to, to the Japanese yen. That says we do expect that there could be uh, some interesting developments in the Bank of Japan. You've got wages growing as, as fast as they have since the early 90s. Uh, actually, just um, a few days back, you had uh, the services producer price index, which, um, again, the three-month annualized number there is, is as fast as we've had since the early 90s as wages start to, to pull in. And the Bank of Japan is hinting that, that it could do uh, a little bit more. Um, having already started its policy normalization. So I think we could see two, maybe even three uh, interest rate hikes from the Bank of Japan throughout the course of this year and, and mm -hmm. into next year if, if things remain the way they are. Wow, three. Okay, that's, that takes us on a different road. 
Ian, just very quickly here, you know, your, your key risk, just looking at your, your current portfolio and how that's constructed, you know, what would, what would cause the biggest pain? What's, what's, what's your kryptonite, sir? So I think it would be a repeat of what we saw in September, October last year, where for whatever reason, there is an unanchoring in, in U.S. yields, and the U.S. 10-year went and uh, tested 5% or above. You know, inflationary fears, lack of a fiscal anchor, um, and, and just a view that, um, you know, with yields at those levels, equity multiples became harder to justify. So that's, again, why being uh, quite cautious on... on the U.S. bond market on U.S. Treasuries um, and looking to the U.S. dollar to protect your portfolio uh, is the way that we're positioned to kind of mitigate that that key risk. Ian, fantastic having you on show. Let's do this again. Ian, Ian Sampson, their uh, multi-asset portfolio manager there at Fidelity. Okay, uh, just going into the open today futures, Hang Seng Index. Uh, we now should be getting a, a quote on that. We're down nine tenths of one percent. So uh, we'll get to the movers. In a moment, on the other side of this break, this is, well, this is Bloomberg. All right, we're just approaching here the, the Wednesday, so it's hump day session here across these markets, and we're going to flash on your screens right now what the approach is looking like and declines just about uh, most of the part of this equity market complex here in Hong Kong weakness coming through in the currency markets. What you're not seeing is yields pushing higher and perhaps that's really where the pain points is coming from when you look across asset uh, right now. Right, a couple of analyst actions to tell you about. I think one that maybe in particular that I'd focus on today is New Oriental because that is actually reinstated at HSBC, these are the ADRs, so that price you see that's in U.S. dollars, that's of course on the back of that pop that you get also overnight. So 110 a pop HSBC. In fact, we are seeing that play out here in Hong Kong. Flip the boards, please, and New Oriental should be coming out later on. Lenovo, of course, convertible bond, that's a big story. We'll unpack this in a moment here. Two billion uh, sold to the Saudi Sovereign Wealth Fund, and as promised, New Oriental up 3%. More on these other names in a moment. The Open, three minutes away. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. You're watching The China Show. 40 seconds to the opening bell. It's uh, fairly uneventful on the macro news flow. I mean, what's new with the Fed telling us that we'll probably need to wait? Uh, some strong data coming through as well out of the U.S. Maybe more in the form of easing measures across these major cities across China. And certainly, Steve, you were covering this yesterday. Shanghai and more are coming yeah, through here. Yeah, Guangzhou and Shenzhen. Guangzhou, 15% down on the asking price right now. Of a lower yeah. asking price at that, too. Yeah, the lower asking price for first-time home buyers. Uh, they're trying to get, uh, you know, sparks some demand. Yeah, we'll see. Now it's a waiting game, right? Yep. Whether or not all of these cities, uh, in fact, we might even get more. Of course, more of these tier one cities follow suit to Shanghai as well, because if you Certainly leave it to the rest, and you see the money go to the rest, really. Okay, uh, flat open across these markets. CSI 300 has been consolidating. Volumes have remained light this week so far, so two or three days now from Friday, where we have seen the 15-day average in volumes trending lower. Um, certainly on price, we've been stuck in a very tight range on, on the major benchmarks here um, as well. Uh, in terms of the fix today, 7-Eleven north of that, out of the PBOC. Uh, we're also getting some lines coming through here out of... Um, Xinhua News uh, talking about how President Xi Jinping is talking about youth unemployment. That should be the focus of focuses, if you will, uh, the priority of, among priorities right. uh, of the government to really try and backstop there, the skill set. More on that in a moment there. Flip the boards, please have a look at Hong Kong and perhaps within that too. Uh, names like New Oriental, which you will see in about, I would say, 30 seconds or so, are starting to see some upside. Most, as you can see, are lower. Uh, here in Hong Kong. Uh, in terms of uh, earnings today, I think you've linked REITs and you also have Alibaba pictures coming out with earnings today. As promised, New Oriental, there we go, 3% up. Uh, ADRs were 
were uh, well, well reinstated by the HSBC. The Hong Kong listing also coming out with mm -hmm. well, HSBC also coming out with their price target on the Hong Kong listing uh, there today. As promised, of course, some of your uh, earnings coming through today. Sinuk, we talked about this. Uh, with the moving up in the oil price uh, overnight into today where you are with Brent prices, for example, that's also one part of the market. Equity market we're also watching very closely. And of course, also on Lenovo, let's flip the words very quickly. We should be down 2% in the pre-markets there. Convertible bond, $2 billion, if I'm not mistaken, sold to the Saudi sovereign wealth fund. We're now down 4% there, 4.5% on shares of Lenovo here in the opening bell. Okay, uh, in terms of some data coming through, Aussie, Inflation, and we're now looking at consumer prices there, 3.6 per... Ooh, that's hot. Okay, that's hot. 3.6%. The estimate was for 3.4%. The Aussie dollar is climbing, unsurprisingly so, on the back of those numbers. ASX 200 is now down about 1% following that number. So any sort of plans or hopes that you had for the RBA, uh, the probability take that a little bit and slash that ever so slightly right now. First quarter total construction down about 3%. The estimate was for half, so this one actually falling even further. Ah, the dilemma for a policymaker at this point in time. But I think the headline really here is um, a hawkish tilt across assets following inflation, which come, came in, coming through out of Australia here for April, 3.6% higher than the median estimate of 3.4%. No, All right, no. David, let's mm. pivot back to the property story out of China. Mm. Uh, Bloomberg Economics says the Chinese government's plan to buy unsold homes can be scaled up with the PBOC playing an even bigger role. Economist David Chu, he joins us now. David, thanks for much for coming in. So how do you see uh, the government and the PBOC indirectly or directly uh, scaling this up and to what level? The latest plan was for 300 billion yuan. There was another plan for about 200, so beyond 500 billion. How do they get there? Oh, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> the first question uh, we, when we assessed the, the total uh, package was that uh, whether it was uh, big enough to boost uh, the whole uh, uh, market economy or to absorb the, the inventory. And after the calculation, we, we found that uh, the, 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 the inventory may be bigger than what people think. Because if you look at the, the uh, uh, NBS National uh, Bureau of Statistics data, mm. uh, it tells us that there was um, about uh, 400 uh, million square meters inventory uh, in the market. But actually, that was only the, uh, the home uh, uh, built, already built. Uh, there are still a lot of homes in construction. So that <clears throat> going forward, this in construction projects will become unsold and build homes in the market so that uh, the authorities need to have a way to absorb that uh, inventory as well. So that is why we call that uh, the size of the whole package can or should uh, be expanded or doubled to absorb about 2% of the total inventory. Yeah, I think the question now is how, how will they be able to pay for it? But before you answer that, though, just some breaking news to tell you about. We're th well, four minutes into the, the onshore market session and the renminbi, this is the onshore rate, uh, just opening up right now at 7, well, we're trading at 7.24.78 right now. And at that open, as you can see, of course, there's a gap. It's, it's now taken us above the high on dollar onshore China to be more specific, that we hit back on April 26, which means, in very, very simple language, that the onshore currency, or the Chinese currency, is now trading at its weakest level going back to November. And unsurprisingly, because the PBOC came out with a, I guess, in a, on, on the fixing side of things, maybe a looser, uh, looser fixing there north of 711. Uh, David, I'll bring you back in. Do you want to talk about the currency, or do you want to talk about how the PBOC is going to pay for all of this? <laughs> I think it's the... Uh Almost the same thing. Yeah. Okay, okay, so, okay. So the PBOC. How exactly is the PBOC going to re fund this repurchase plan? Yeah, we saw that uh, uh, last Friday. The PBOC said that they are going to provide a three hundred billion dollar. Uh, sorry, let me be to uh, to fund the home uh, home purchase project. And after that, since. This Monday, we, we have seen the, the uh, renminbi uh, depreciation against the, the dollar. So that uh, the, the market, well, I think the, the, the thing is straightforward because the market think, the market is reading on this op operation is that it could be or, uh, uh, a limited and a targeted QE. 
because the the the, uh, the PBOC can expand its balance sheet on this. So. Mm. Uh, the first reaction of the market is okay. Okay, or we we saw the hope for for the Chinese government, uh, Chinese uh, economy to, to to recover, but then the, they they realized that this could be a QE. So that is why I think uh, the, the the depreciation pressure is getting back. Now this rescue package that is coming out, uh, yeah, it, it lifted sentiment. Also, we're getting more piecemeal approach to, uh, you know, removing the restrictions for first-time home buyers now in Shenzhen and Guangzhou, and including yesterday uh, Shanghai. Does all of this combined put a floor on the falling sentiment? Yes, okay. we can say that it helps the sentiment. Uh, but to be honest, um, I think it's still a bit too early to call uh, a stabilization or a bottoming out of the housing sector uh, because we have seen a lot of uh, uh, issues that they need to solve in the in practice when they uh, uh, when they do when they implement this home purchase uh, plan. Mm. Uh, well, I have to say that easing the home purchase restriction is easier, but to put into putting the home purchase plan into practice is a bit harder because, uh, firstly, you need to identify which project you need to buy and how, you know, uh, the, because the PBOC uh, set up some um, uh, limitation on, on using of the money mm. and how you can achieve, uh, uh, you know, yeah, use, if you want to use the PBOC's money, you need to you know take this on and so count this on. So they don't want it to go to the stock market or other risky assets, right? Taking the proceeds from the PBOC, right? Mm. I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, of course, it's yeah. not necessary actually. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. all right. Well, uh, David, thank you so much, David Chu. There, just unpacking really the latest take here on the latest news coming out of mainland China. So, in terms of affordability, can do. Okay, nong zuoda. Okay, um, all right, I'm just shifting language there. Okay, Tianjin, oh, here we go. Okay, so on that news that we were just talking about here of more tier one cities moving to ease home purchase restrictions here, according to a report, and this doesn't seem to be official the way this headline is actually phrased, Tianjin, which is the mega city, of course, right Next to next to Beijing is easing some home purchase rules. Yeah, Steve, you're sure, seeing so something. So this too. this just adds another tier one city. Uh, Tianjin, obviously a tier one city, mm -hmm. the port city, uh, southeast of Beijing. Uh, Beijing hasn't done it yet, though. Keep in mind. Yeah. So uh, Shanghai, Guangzhou, Shenzhen, now Tianjin. We'll have to see what Beijing possibly does, if at all. So okay, incrementally better, of course, yeah. with more and more of these cities. Okay. Um, very quickly here. So the BOJ, and just to abrupt pivot here. We talked about the bond yield in Japan is now at the highest in 2011 here. So the BOJ actually releasing the text of a speech of a board member. So that just qualifies these lines coming through. Uh, the board member is Seiji Adachi talking about how, well, a couple of things that sticky inflation is likely to rise steadily. That's hawkish. Inflation may pick up pace from the summer to fall. That's hawkish. Uh, it's important to keep real rates negative. So if that is phrased counterintuitively, that effectively means we might need higher nominal rates given where you are with those inflation expectations down the road. Yeah. But they must avoid a premature rate hike that takes us maybe into debate as we approach the June meeting there out of uh, the Bank of Japan. Right. Okay. We'll leave those two stories there for now. Glance at uh, Japan assets as we speak. Uh, in the meantime, though, Steve, I think we have some other stories we're tracking. Yeah, that's right. Some news that we're tracking out of China. Chinese President Xi Jinping is pledging to prioritize youth employment and direct more resources to the job creation. Uh, state media says they used the Politburo session to emphasize that graduates must be able to find employment. Nearly 12 million graduates, new graduates, will enter China's job market this year. Youth unemployment hit a record high in 2023 in the summer of last year before Beijing changed the counting method to exclude students. China has sentenced an ex-official with China Huarong International to death. 
on bribery charges as authorities crack down on financial crime. CCTV state media reports that Bai Tianhui took bribes totaling $153 million. Bai is the second former executive linked to China Huarong Asset Management facing a death sentence. Its former chairman was executed for bribery in 2021. All right, while well, coming up, Taiwanese lawmakers passing legislation that could curb the authority of newly inaugurated President Lai Ching De. Details on the divisive debate coming up next. This is Bloomberg. Mixed uh, to mostly to the downside across these major markets, major stocks right now. But as you can see, some upside we're seeing onshore um, up 11 or 12 points. I'll be generous with the CSI 300. Okay, uh, let's pivot now to Taiwan, where lawmakers have now passed legislation that could curb the authority of the new president, Lai Jing De. The debate, of course, prompted days of protests both inside and outside parliament. Let's bring in uh, Chen Huan Wan, our Bloomberg reporter, to just talk us through this, joining us out of Taipei here. So, yeah, so this has now, it's now passed. Give us some context here. Yes, uh, hi. Uh, the lawmakers yesterday just passed this. Uh, uh, while the society thinks it's a very controversy, controversy bill that will uh, give the legislator more power over the executive, uh, over the government, so they can now bring in people, bring in governors, uh, bring in of company CEOs and even general public to the parliament for hearing. And they can start their own investigation on certain cases right now. And they are now, uh, so right now they can also ask the, the president to answer their questions on site in the parliament. So Jian Huan, uh, I understand that Lai's uh, ruling DPP party will seek a constitutional review of this new bill. Uh, what are the prospects for possibly overturning this or essentially arresting that uh, movement by the opposition KMT and their partner TPP to undermine Lai's uh, presidency? Well, this is like, uh, it, it has been the argument if those uh, bills are actually uh, constitutional. So right now they will basically go, to, uh, so the first step is for the executive yuan to send the bill back to the lawmakers to review once again. But it's very likely for the legislator to to again pass, the, pass these uh, bills. And after that, so uh, the the DPP, the DPP will will seek for a constitutional review, and that that might uh, take, I don't know, maybe up to months for a review and a result. But uh, if that, uh, well, before the result comes out and like uh, saying it's unconstitutional and to uh, to abandon abandon the law, so but. Uh, before that, the, the law will pass and to take effects on the government right now. Tianhua, thanks so much for your time. We'll be checking back with you as this, of course, uh, story develops. Let's pivot now to Hong Kong, where police there here have arrested six people using a new security law, the domestic security law, for the first time. Among them is a former organizer of a now-banned annual vigil to commemorate the 1989 Tiananmen Square crackdown. Uh, for more, let's bring in the Bloomberg editor, Alan Wong. Alan one, how significant is this, and how did it transpire? Because I believe the person who was arrested was already in detention. That's Miss Chow. Uh, and apparently she was communicating with another five people, allegedly, about a sensitive date that is upcoming. We all know that to be the Tiananmen commemoration. What can you tell us? Yes, that's right. Um, Chow Han Chong is the target of these arrests. She has been uh, under detention for many months now uh, in a maximum security institution for other crimes. Um, but, um, other alleged crimes, but um, he, she was uh, accused of using Facebook to make these posts inciting people to join some unnamed unlawful acts around this very sensitive date, which, by the way, the Hong Kong government has just refused to name. Um, we know that um, those, you know, those posts were made in a Facebook group, and uh, I took a look earlier today, and then uh, I saw a bunch of posts about 
um, you know, Chow herself and also the Tiananmen Square uh, anniversary coming up. Uh, I don't know which posts were the offending uh, articles, but uh, they are apparently uh, uh, against the new domestically made uh, national security law. And in terms of the timing on why now, it's probably not a coincidence that the date is coming up. Yeah, we're just uh, less than a week away from the 35th anniversary of the Tiananmen Square crackdown. And uh, it's an occasion that Hong Kong uh, democracy advocates used to mark every year without fail until, um, until Beijing's national security crackdown ended the vigil. And the organizer actually uh, was shut down under this pressure. So how do you see or, or do people see this, uh, which was Article 23 that became the domestic uh, national security law, uh, working in tandem with the national security law that came into law, what is in 2020? Uh, is this the concern that this could be used again to crack down on free speech here? I think that is one signal that the government wants to send is that even if they said uh, just two months ago that they want to move on from all these talk talks about security by passing the security law and to focus on economic development, they will use this law against perceived threats to national security. And um, the Hong Kong officials also said that uh, by, you know, uh, they will take resolute action against these threats and the use of this law at this time will help set the bar uh, on when, you know, uh, when the government will move against these targets. Alan, thank you so much for getting us up to speed there. Alan Wong there, our China Economy Government Editor. Just some other stories that we're tracking across the world here. So the latest on Israel, the military says that its tanks have reached the center of the southern Gaza city of Rafah as it conducts a limited and precise set of operations. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu insists a ground invasion of Rafah is needed to root out thousands of Hamas fighters. The U.S. meanwhile says Sunday's airstrike on a Rafah camp that reportedly killed 45 people will not mean a change of policy on supplying weapons to Israel. Now, Saudi Arabia's Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman says his father, King Salman, has recovered from a recent illness. The Saudi government announced earlier this month that the 88-year-old monarch here was being treated for fever and also a lung infection. Questions over the king's health came as Iran was rocked by the death of its president and other top officials in a helicopter crash. Now, closing arguments have wrapped up in the hush money trial of Donald Trump. Now, New York prosecutors say a mountain of evidence connects the former president to illicit payments to a former porn star. Now, I'm talking about Stormy Daniels here to keep quiet about an alleged sexual encounter. Now, Trump's lawyers earlier accused a star prosecution uh, witness here, Trump's former attorney, as you can see on your screen on your right, Michael Cohen, of repeatedly lying. Now, jury deliberations could begin as soon as Wednesday. Right, that's our wrap of stories we're tracking at this point. We'll get you a wrap up of the big moves across these markets. We're 20 minutes into the cash market session. A glance at the treasury curve right now where gains we're seeing on the short end still declines on the long end. This is The China Show. Welcome back to shows here. Some top corporate stories that we're following right now. So Toyota's proposal to re-elect uh, Chairman Akio uh, Toyota is, well, to its board, is coming under pressure from two leading proxy advisory firms. Uh, Institutional Shareholder Services is urging investors to vote against the founding family members, citing improper vehicle testing and also regulatory violations. And separately, Glass Lewis has also recommended a no the vote. Now, the Chinese car maker BYD and shares I don't believe about seven straight days now has unveiled this new hybrid powertrain that's well able to travel more than 2,000 kilometers without recharging or refueling. The upgrade means that some of the automaker's hybrids could cover the distance from New York to Miami or Munich to Madrid on a single charge and full tank. Now, uh, the first two vehicles with the upgrade will be mid-sized sedans, including the SEAL 06. 
Now, official Chinese data suggests that Apple's iPhone sales bounced back in April with shipments jumping 52% from a year back. It's thanks to a flurry of discounts. Sales first showed signs of stabilization back in March after steep declines in the first two months of 2024. Now, Apple and its Chinese resellers have been cutting prices since the start of this year. Right, just a glance, quick glance, to be more specific at these markets right now. So we're looking at dollar China. So we opened at a level that was above the high back on April 26, which effectively means we're now trading at a weakest level here on onshore currency going back to November of this year. Property stocks in focus. Of course, we had a flurry of news coming out re last 48 hours. Shanghai, other mega cities uh, in the Guangdong province, and these report today that Tianjin is also following that easing some home purchase restrictions there um, that's on the back of report as you can see of course we're looking at gains uh, across many of these benchmarks and many of these names here as well uh, the benchmark story is one that is mixed so the Hang Seng index is giving up that we well going into the close yesterday taking a I guess a step back here losing some momentum so we're down a further 1.2 percent uh, four tenths of one percent to the upside certainly we have been in a very tight range on shore and the glands Across assets across the region, weakness in equity markets, a lot of weakness in the bond space on your screen. Plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to The China Show. Here's a look at the Hang Seng Index. We're about in a half an hour into the Wednesday session. So uh, just on price, we are down a sixth session in the last seven. You could say the same certainly across most of the other benchmarks given a sort of overlap in an in index constituency. Uh, we're down 1% on the Hang Seng uh, 8 shares index as well. In terms of momentum, we've certainly lost some momentum. So we've come off really and I think context is really here. We've come up really some extreme levels and momentum and uh, overbought conditions. We were trading at, well, the 14-day RSI, and this one was trading north of about 80. We're now back to about 53. So in many ways, we've sort of reset, hit a reset button. Where do we go from here? What are the next catalysts? Certainly, we're done with earnings season. Uh, in terms of just policy prescription, we are getting more news coming out on the property space. More on that in a moment here. As far as the macro picture is concerned here, so context too. Um, the, we had a horrible session, by the way, in Treasuries overnight, so hence we're seeing yields already on weaker footing as we woke up in the Asia Pacific. And then you had this hot CPI print coming out of Australia, 3.6%, uh, forecast for 3.4%. Uh, this is putting pressure on currencies, for example. We can talk more about that in a moment with uh, Mary Nicola. Uh, just very, very quickly here, uh, Asia x China and the look across these equity markets. And we were pointing out that just lack of conviction out there. So S&P futures are down. Uh, we're looking at seven tenths of one percent to the downside here on MSCI Asia Pacific two and ten bond futures. Why would we get bond futures? There, we're trading right now. Any case, of course, we are seeing some pressure on uh, on the long end of the curve. And dollar, we're looking at. Uh, do we have the pound against? Um, I'm, I'm just shout out here to my producer Ernest. If we can get that up, please, at some point here. Uh, the pound is actually trading at fairly strong levels against the Japanese currency, too. So that's actually one specific major pair that we have been tracking. So the close on Tuesday was north of 200, which effectively puts that specific cross at the highest going back 16 years. The 30-year yield uh, in, in the U.S. as well, just to mention that, so that's where you really saw the biggest move overnight. We're seeing that move the opposite direction right now. Uh, but all that being said, it's certainly a conversation around going into this core CPI print and, and some comments coming through out of Neil Kashkari that, you know what, these, your hopes that we're going to get a rate cut, September, maybe not. Let's push that back even further. We're on a date, data-dependent, month-to-month basis as well. Anyway, more on that in a moment. Uh, let's get a context here and maybe some additional narrative from Mary Nicola with us from Singapore, our MLive strategist. Mary... I guess the story today is not so much in the equity markets, but this melt up we're seeing in yields. Uh, just your thoughts on what's happening today. Yeah, you've had a combination of just tepid demand from the auctions, whether it was the two-year or the five-year, and then, of course, some comments from Neil Kashkari just compound this, the whole, the, these, this threesome just compounding the effects on 
um, on, on yields that we've seen. Um, obviously, it's still that the narrative is higher for longer, but of course, any mention of a rate hike, a rate hike just spooks markets. Even if Neil Kashkari added that he would, that it was a very low probability, it's the fact that yields are going to stay higher for longer. That is going continue, to continues to resonate with markets and continues to spook them. And of course, then it emphasizes how data dependent the Fed is. So we're still going from one data point to the next data point, which means that every single one is significant, which means we get significant swings um, in market, in, in market uh, volatility and in price action as a result. Yeah, well, that takes us into the, the, the dollar China story. And should we be surprised that the onshore rate is now trading at the weakest since November? I think we opened above uh, the high that we hit back on April 26 in dollar China, Mary. You know, I think the key thing here with dollar China is that we're going to remain steady. So any sort of depreciation that we get from dollar China is going to be very slow and steady. And largely the fact of, yes, there's depreciation pressures on, on China from increased capital outflows and rate differentials, etc. But at the end of the day, it's very hard to see that the um, there's a significant depreciation in the yuan when, there's, when trade tensions are escalating, because that could also be seen as a move by the U.S. and Europe. Europe as a way to exasperate tensions. So any depreciation that we see in the yuan will be slow and steady. Okay, what else is on your mind? I think some of the main things right now is just what's happening with the yen, especially on the crosses. Um, that is has been, whether you mentioned earlier about sterling, whether euro, Aussie yen, all of it has been showing that the yen is coming under pressure and it's going to likely remain under mm. pressure. The key thing here is that there is no alternative funding currency that you have within G10. You're getting um, news everywhere that is highlighting this higher for longer, whether it's from Australia, from the US, which all puts pressure on the yen. And then you've had some comments from some BOJ members this morning highlighting that there is going to, that some dovishness still um, that is um, spurring within the BOJ. So it, ki it, it kind of will mm. exacerbate some of the pressure that we're going to see on the yen. And then also, if you look at how the yen is moving against the crosses, it's actually been in line with what we've seen from risk. So as risk appetite improves, that also weighs on the yen. And how should we be looking at you know this, this BOJ meeting in, I think it's mid mid-June, I think June 14, I could be mistaken on that, but Mary, on the back of comments of the pushback, that's fine, you know, there's a massive rate differential that we're looking at here, but, you know, what expectations should we have on the rate path of the BOJ in the coming meetings? Yeah, I think every meeting is going to be a live meeting, that's for sure. Um, mm. But the fact is of whether they pull the trigger is going to be another story. With you, When Bloomberg Economics expects that you're going to get your first hike in July and then you can in uh, um, October, but even then you only bring rates to about half a percent. How does half a percent really compare? And plus a lot of that is already baked in to some degree. So it doesn't leave much room for yen uh, yen appreciation as a result, especially when the global central banks are sitting on their hands and being a little bit more patient when it comes to rates, rate, uh, rate cuts. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I like how you compare that. My comparison there, Mary, would be taking three bottles of tequila and then half an Advil and then hoping things are going to be okay. Mary, thank you so much <laughs> in Singapore for thank us. Thank you. Um, a, a couple of movers to, well, I guess in some ways things would be okay for a moment until they're not. I mean, take, take the full Advil. Have two. But make sure, of course, you take antacid because that, is, that, that tends to have negative effects on your stomach. Anyway, um, what am I talking about here? Lenovo, convertible bond here, $2 billion. This was the big story this morning. $2 billion U.S. dollars worth of convertibles issued. The Saudi Wealth Fund is here. So the PC maker says it has inked the strategic partnership and more Chinese firms, of course, have been seeking these cheap funding via convertibles. Uh, recently, if you recall, Alibaba was the one, of course, that tapped a similar uh, a part of the capital structure. New Oriental, 4.5% uh, now. Big move up overnight. HSBC came out, ADRs, and also the Hong Kong listing. Might also have to do with the fact that uh, President Xi Jinping reported by Xinhua talking about how youth unemployment might be 
um, should be actually should be re let me rephrase that should be the the focus of the, the top priority of the government and also the president talking about how they might need to look at some of these educational courses um, just making sure that graduates are you know have the proper skills to match where China wants to be as far as the economy is high-tech economy is concerned right BYD and CNUC uh, on your screens as well. Energy stocks on the way up, of course, on the back of what's been happening in the Middle East. And of course, BYD, you have this, of course, this new plug-in hybrid. So as things stand, snapping, I believe, which should be about a six-day six -day decline on that specific stock. Okay, movers there for now. Let's get uh, an update on what's coming up here on shows. The, the business outlook for DBS, this part of the world here, and of course, we're privileged to be joined in a couple of minutes here with Sebastian Paredes, the head of North Asia for the bank. They're also having, of course, their fourth GBA conference, is my understanding. So more on that also in a moment. We're talking all things Greater Bay Area and all things banking with the bank CEO there for the region. This is Moomba. So signs of recovery, but yes, there is still more that uh, needs to, we need to see more evidence of that. But I think despite that, we do expect that growth will be around 5% this year. There you go. That was the IMF second commander, Gita Gopinath, uh, on just, well, the outlook here really. Uh, and by the way, speaking of China here, so in terms of just the upgrades here, it's not just them, right? So you're looking at also some of the private economists have also bumped up their forecasts here for the Chinese economy. Uh, in fact, more on that number. So uh, previous and current. So when I say previous, which is April, the current forecast for this economy, 4.9%. Okay, what else has changed here? Retail sales has been uh, slightly lowered as well. It's the composition of growth, isn't it, where we really need to have a hard conversation moving forward. So we know exports have been doing well. We know the, the central government has raised quite a bit of money in the special bond market there. So that's going to go into infrastructure spending. That's going to go into investment spending. But really where you are in the consumer is the big question here as well. 4.9% though is the thinking from private economists as well. Now on this property story, okay, this, this story keeps giving. So a reminder, right, last 24 hours, I think it was Shanghai two other cities in, in the Guangdong province, Shenzhen and Guangzhou. In fact, in Guangzhou, if I'm not mistaken, you can now take at a mortgage 15% down payment on already lower asking prices. The latest here to come out is Shenyang also scrapping their home buying curve. So that's an official announcement coming through. And about 30, okay, I'm losing track of time, 32 minutes back. The Tianjin Daily reported that Tianjin is also looking to follow some of these tier one cities as well. So as we were talking about earlier on shows, it's just a matter of time. We wait, right? We wait, we let it simmer, and then we'll see if these if buyers then come in and take advantage of really what frankly is really um, fairly relaxed entry points to this property market. Anyway, I digress. Let's talk about banking. Let's talk about the state of the economy that goes into this as well. Let's talk about Hong Kong. Uh, joining us exclusively here on set is Sebastian Paredes, DPS, head of North Asia. He is also the bank's China chairman and Hong Kong CEO. You wear so many hats. I'm struggling where to start. Why don't we start with Hong Kong? How, how's the business doing? Thank you, David. Uh, thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. Hong Kong is, uh, as you said before, uh, experiencing a, a very important slowdown, mm -hmm. uh, derived from the slowdown, of course, of China and the impact of post-COVID, uh, slow op opening and, and so forth. But uh, the banking sector is, continues to be resilient. The banking sector, despite interest rate differential from mainland China, despite high interest rates, and despite the uh, tourism not meeting our expectations post-opening, is doing quite well, is resilient. DBS Hong Kong, for example, last year we grew 12% net profit after tax. For the first time ever, we reached 9.2 billion right. net profit after tax, which is 1.1 billion US dollars. Uh, that for the fifth largest bank in Hong Kong is significant. 
our, um, our return on equity has uh, continuously been above 20%. This is something that I don't disclose publicly, but it's been a, one of the highest return on equity franchises of DBS Group. Our cost to income ratio is 37%. So I think that uh, we have performed ex uh, exceedingly uh, well in 2023. Most importantly, our uh, losses related to China property derived uh, customers have been very insignificant to our size. So we've managed that a portfolio quite well in, in the last seven years. Right. You, you've reduced your activity there, I think, as, as to your point, seven years ago, a couple of years back, you've started to really pull back because of the risk in, involved there. In, in fact, we didn't really reduce it. We, we have progressively in the last 10 years... The property, I mean. Correct. Yeah. We, we have progressively focused on the most important and resilient names in China. So we didn't really go into second tier okay. uh, cities, second tier names. So that's why we avoided uh, the accidents that uh, some did not. Yeah, well, some challenges, let's, let, let's put it that way. All right, so you've done well 2023. How did you manage to do that amidst what was a challenging time for, particularly in, when you look at loan books, for example, you know, the economy slowing as well? Well, year on year, the first quarter, as you know, loan book for the industry dropped again 5.4%. Mm. The interest rate differential as well as the high interest rates is having a toll on the loan book for the industry in Hong Kong. Uh, however, the same aspect of high interest rates is helping the banks that have a very strong funding franchise, like ourselves, and that is offsetting the impact of the loan uh, decrease. At the same time, and reflecting the critical position of uh, Hong Kong as an international center, mm. wealth management business continues to be one of the drivers of higher rate of growth for, for banks in, uh, in Hong Kong. So I would say, Wealth management, our funding franchise, as well as insurance post-opening have been one of the key drivers for our growth and high return on equity. Right. What do you make of the, the uh, Hong Kong government's moves here to shore up Hong Kong as a wealth hub? How does that tangibly help a bank like yours, which you point out is doing very well already? I think it's very important to promote the continuous access of Chinese tourists coming to the city. Hmm. So the efforts that the Hong Kong government is doing, uh, engaging the China government to allow more tourists to come to the city is very important. Also the efforts around, you know, positioning the city as an entertainment hub, hmm. as a conference hub, uh, as a, a tourist, a multi-tourist hub is also very important. That will take some time to, uh, to materialize. But nonetheless, um, I see the government uh, making a huge amount of efforts to, um, to improve the positioning of the city. Mm. Notwithstanding, it is very clear that the linkages between Hong Kong and China are very, very strong. And whilst China is facing this economic downturn, clearly Hong Kong will experience as well. Um, the tourists, for example, which we see that the tourist growth in domestic tourism in China is so high. However, in Hong Kong, it's still 70 percent of compared to 19, uh, 2019. So we still right. have a long way to go um, to, uh, to have the positioning that we had pre-COVID. Uh, pre and on top of that, the strength of the dollar, because we have a peg currency to the dollar. Yeah. When you look at... We have at, to import what Powell does. Exactly. When you cross the border to Shenzhen or you go to Japan, you see the competitive disadvantages of pricing is, um, is pushing an outflow of tourism from Hong Kong rather than right. getting more inflow into Hong Kong. Well, yeah. well, since you mentioned, do you see rates coming down this year? Um, what our, are you planning our, on? Our house view, our hmm. house view is two... Two rate decreases starting okay. from uh, third, fourth quarter. Okay. Uh, but still, you know, the inflation, the global inflation uh, proves to be very sticky. Right. And uh, I would say that um, the probabilities of those, of those uh, rate decreases are still uh, questionable, mm. I would say. Uh, so rate, higher rates for longer, I think that's my, my own view. Okay. Now, the, on wealth specifically... Are you seeing more assets come into the city, whether that's from the mainland or, or separately? You're a Singaporean bank, of course, from Singapore. You have some money laundering issues there as well. Do you see that in some way benefiting Hong Kong somewhat? Um, I think that the, uh, there is a very important wealth management uh, centers in, in Asia, Singapore hmm. and Hong Kong. Singapore clearly attracts a huge amount of wealth 
from Southeast Asian countries, from India, and also from China. Hong Kong at the same time, um, mm. from China mainly, and Taiwan now, uh, more and more. Is that the bulk of your wealth business? Uh, our mainly bulk, Chinese, uh, no, our, bulk, bulk, uh, Kong, our private think. banking business in Hong Kong is mainly Hong Kongers, okay. wealthy Hong Kongers, more and more Chinese wealth. And now in the last uh, 12 months, I've seen a substantial amount of Taiwanese uh, money coming into the city. Okay. We have had our, our highest business uh, growth last year was our private banking business. So we are now probably one of the, of the highest growth private banking business in Hong Kong. Are you, does that mean you're hiring? Because the, oh, some, yeah. of, some of your other peers are reducing their headcount. Oh, we've, we've never reduced our headcount. We okay. continue to hire even through the cycle. Um, this year, for example, we are expanding more than 25% our headcount in private banking business uh, alone. So yeah, we are hiring. We are taking advantage of the uh, changes in the market. Hmm. We're taking advantage of you know, some of the other international banks uh, probably de-risking. Hmm. And um, DBS is very well positioned in this environment. Okay, yeah, you know, since you brought it up, I was at a UBS conference yesterday. And I believe you guys have a big conference too next week. We do. We have our fourth uh, GBA conference in Shenzhen. Uh, we expect to have about 500 customers from all GBA cities, including Hong Kong. Um, we are going to focus on AI, Gen AI, right. and of course, uh, high ad advanced technologies. Uh, we do seem to talk a lot about real estate and the challenges in China about real yeah. estate, but there are some pockets of industries that are creating substantial amount of uh, GDP growth in China and thus in Hong Kong, hmm. and therefore we are, um, we are making sure that GBA continues to play a very important part to the bank franchise in China as well to the bank franchise in Hong Kong. Right, so how are you looking to get involved uh, in the GBA? For example, you have key drivers, what are the specific opportunities then? So we are, for example, the, the ecosystem growth of advanced technology manufacturing. Are we still e talking EVs or is this something else now? Like uh, EVs, EVs clearly is a, is a very important okay. uh, part of the industry growth and the ecosystem around EVs. Right. Um, solar panels and clean energy production, manufacturing as well, not only on the product itself, but on the ecosystem that that creates mm. and advanced technologies. Now, we are adding this year in our conference AI and Gen AI and what it means in terms of uh, software development, in terms of the utilization of data centers, in terms of the ecosystem that Gen AI might bring uh, to both um, hard, uh, hardware as well as software. The, what does it mean for your loan book, though? Are you looking to put some money to work as far as loan growth I'm not, on those uh, sectors? I'm not very optimistic about total loan growth okay. whilst interest rate differentials remain so high. Uh, but indeed, our loan growth in mainland China, for example, for DBS China, hmm. continues to grow double digits very robust, hmm. especially in these new industries. However, in Hong Kong, because of the Hong Kong and U.S. dollar denominated loans still uh, quite high. Okay. Uh, so Do you but, see that changing though? But most sure? importantly, deposits, growth in the industry, new customer acquisitions, that's right. very important. Give you a data. Go ahead. Um, this year, we acquired close to 1,200 new Chinese mainland customers in our wealth management business in Hong Kong. We acquire close to 700 companies in Hong Kong every month. Hmm. So those are significant numbers that are beefing up our franchise in Hong Kong, as well as giving us opportunities in mainland China. Well, we wish the conference, of course, goes fantastically well. Of course, thank you for joining us here on set. We didn't get to talk about Taiwan, where I believe you're not the biggest foreign bank there because of the city, uh, uh, city transaction. Maybe next time. Likewise. Let's talk about that. Sebastian Pared is there, head of North Asia at DBS. Stock price bottom of your screen should come up as well. If you're a Bloomberg subscriber, you can catch up with that interview you might have missed here on our interactive TV function. There you go on your screens. TV Go on your terminals. Happy Wednesday morning. You're watching The China Show. Welcome back. Some breaking news right now. On your screens, you'll see a number of names. I would ignore the top three and look at Samsung Electronics. Um, so we now understand from the company that these wage talks have failed. Earlier on, Yonhap News, this is about 30 minutes back, reported that the labor union uh, would be going on strike. And now we know that the labor union says it will stage that first strike, that strike uh, for the first time. Um, they'll be holding a press briefing in Seoul uh, at 
11 a.m. today. Well, effectively, we're getting these lines from the press briefing, just to be more specific. There we go. That's a line there. Also breaking news coming through this hour on the city, on the property story in China. The, a major city in Shenyang has now also scrapped their home purchase restrictions. So look at property names on your screens. This is Bloomberg. We're just going into the Tokyo lunch break, and so a couple of commentary, well, comments coming through out of this. Well, for one, this the BOJ releasing a speech of a board member talking about how the need for real rates to remain positive. Um, although that being said, of course, maybe pushing back against the notion that we might need to see immediate rate increases uh, on the horizon right now. So, but all that being said, in terms of price action, is really this bond bleed we're seeing not just in Japan but across the region. Treasuries were absolutely whacked overnight. We're seeing the play out here in the Asia Pacific, and then we had that hot inflation report in um, out of Australia. Um, I think 3.6 percent, I believe, was the, was the print there above estimates. And hence, we're now trading at 107 is your 10-year yield in Japan. That's a new 2011 high uh, on that specific one as well. Right, so flip the boards, please, if we can, and talking about that too. So we have just the flavor of the region here. So we're down 7 tenths of 1%. By the way, I should mention equity markets are not a really a big story. Uh, big story today. Volumes are on the lighter side of things across most of these markets, with the exception, I guess, of some pockets of strength, like the CSI 300, about an hour into that session here, 6 tenths of 1%. The 30-year yield, big move up overnight. We're still incrementally up uh, right now. Uh, the 10-year yield in Australia, of course, that's a big move we had early on. We talked about the inflation story and the weakness in the Japanese currency, not just against the U.S. dollar. But so let me just call your attention to the, the bottom row, one, two, three, four from the left. Um, cable, well, well, the pound against the Japanese yen, 200 spot 61. Uh, last time we had a print of this sort was way back 16 years ago. So uh, it's certainly broken through some key, not just psychological levels, but I mean, what you know? How do you extrapolate this chart now if you have to go back 16 years? Right. Um, just very briefly, too. Just some news coming through out of China, in case you missed that. Too, as you look at where you are in the bond yield right now. So the Ministry of Finance has now come out. I believe I'm just looking at this as well. Has now come out with a specific figure. Uh, on how much, how yeah, the the amount of bonds it's planning to sell this year in Hong Kong, to be more specific, right? So we're looking at 55 billion yuan in government bonds to be sold in Hong Kong this year. That's according to uh, the Ministry of Finance. It takes us into this broader conversation in China. Are things getting better? The answer, short answer is yes. The qualifier is incrementally. If you ask the IMF, if you ask. Uh, private economists, they've bumped up their forecasts uh, for the Chinese economy, 4.9%. In fact, the IMF also raised their own forecast there for China. So the fund now expects 5% expansion on this Chinese economy instead of this 4.6% that they had for an earlier projection that now puts it in line with Beijing's own growth target of around 5%. Um, uh, First Deputy Managing Director Gita Gopinat spoke exclusively to, with Bloomberg about why they upgraded that specific forecast. Have a look. We've upgraded China's growth by 0.4 percentage points for this year and for next. So we have growth now projected at 5% for this year and 4.6% for next year. There are two main drivers for that. The first is the better than expected first quarter GDP numbers that came out uh, for 2024. That is lifting up our growth projection. And the second is we have incorporated some of the newer announcements that have been made on the policy front. So those are the two main reasons for the upgrade. But some say 5% is actually out of reach for China. They say private sector sentiment is still weak. The property sector is also in the doldrum, 16 million homes still unsold, and some point to Chanavanka under a lot of financial stress. At some point, Gita, that is likely to weigh on confidence, weigh on sentiment, weigh on growth as well. What's your take on that? So China's economy is continuing to recover. So we certainly are seeing that consumption is recovering, but still it has some ways to go. The, the strength we're seeing in public investment remains. Private investment is still weak, mainly because of the weakness in the property sector. So we are seeing uh, 
so signs of recovery. But yes, there is still more that uh, needs to, we need to see more evidence of that. But I think it, despite that, we do expect that growth will be around 5% uh, this year. What more needs to be done? So firstly, I would like to recognize the uh, policy steps that have been taken. I mean, the recent announcement, uh, which involves uh, upgrading equipment of uh, firms, but also consumer goods of households, that can help. But yes, uh, in our view, uh, more will be needed. And so specifically on the property sector front, I think what would be very helpful is to deal with the problem of pre-sold housing. So there are a large number of house houses that have been pre-sold but have not been completed. Here, we see a bigger role for the central government to come in and to, to, to deal with that, to be able to complete those pre-sold houses. Because when that happens, that's going to help household confidence, which is really essential at this time, and also will help with the exit of non-viable developers. Secondly, in terms of providing support, while overall we think that there should be a fiscal neutral stance, I think it is important that the spending goes in the direction of helping low-income households, because that, they are the ones who are able to consume more of that additional income, and that will also provide a boost to the economy. How are you assessing other risks? Some say that there's a risk of a new trade war. Of course, we heard from G7 finance ministers calling out China on its trade pack practices. We have the U.S. saying that it will reimpose those tariffs expiring. And we have China itself saying that it might impose 25% tariffs on imported autos from the U.S. as well as Europe. How might this play out? How might it impact China's economy as well as the economy of the world? Yeah. I was just in Stresa for these uh, G7 meetings, so I'm coming from there. Uh, and, you know, there is certainly, we're certainly living in times where there is uh, questions being raised about the global trading system and the fairness of it. Uh, the IMF, as a general rule, we are strongly in favor of an open rule-based trading system. And therefore, any disputes that countries have with each other, we believe, should be handled to the, through the multilateral trading system, I mean, through the WTO. Now, there are concerns that are being raised. Industrial policies is something that comes up uh, in conversations everywhere. It, many countries deploy industrial policies. That has implications not just for their own resource allocation, but also potential spillovers to the rest of the world. And that is generating risks of uh, greater fragmentation. But here is why, where we think it's critical for countries not to move unilaterally outside the multilateral trading system to address this, but to work uh, with each other to strengthen the trading system, to come up with you know, better rules of engagement when you have countries using subsidies so that there's a common agreed principle on how to deal with these kinds of issues. You talked about industrial policy over capacity. That was uh, one issue that was raised to us by Le Maire in an interview with Bloomberg. He says that perhaps uh, cheap Chinese goods will be detrimental to the whole global economy. How are you assessing that? So firstly, I think when we, uh, when we are looking at China, we should just step back and recognize the, the macro situation. So the fact that overall demand in China remains weak, we still have a negative output gap uh, predicted for China. So in an environment where there is weak demand, of course, that's going to generate uh, imbalances. And that's where action needs to be taken. S keep setting aside the implications for the rest of the world, just with China itself, being able to raise demand is going to be very helpful. Secondly, again, for all countries, including China, that are deploying industrial policies, you have to make sure you're doing this in a targeted in a, in a manner which is also temporary. Otherwise, you're going to end up with just misallocating resources within your own country, again, setting aside the spillovers to the rest of the world. So for individual countries' perspective, it is important to make sure the resources get well allocated. And sometimes these industrial policies just distort signals. And you end up with a much less productive economy. So these are uh, you know, issues the countries need to pay uh, close attention to. Yeah, there we go. That was Haz, of course, there with the first deputy managing director of the IMF, Gita uh, Gokina. All right, uh, let's uh, get you up to speed on some other news taking place around the world right now and the updates here. So. Uh, it's been an eventful few days, of course, in Taiwan, going back, of course, to the inauguration of, of, of the president there. And so now the update here is the parliament has now passed 
uh, legislation that could curb the authority of the new president, Lai ching -te. The new measures allow lawmakers to summon the president for questioning and give access to confidential documents. Now, thousands uh, protesters gathered to oppose the changes. The bill was actually backed by the opposition, KMT and TPP, both of which have backed closer ties with China. Now, Hong Kong's National Security Police have arrested six people using a new security law for the very first time. Among them is a former organizer of a now bad annual vigil to commemorate the 1989 Tiananmen Square crackdown. Uh, police say uh, Chao Hang Tong made online posts with seditious intent inciting people to join unlawful acts. Now, she is currently in detention for a separate charge. A uh, brief look at oil prices right now continuing to move up, albeit, of course, modestly. The big move really took place in a 12 hours before the last four. Uh, so give or take, we're back above 80 bucks, and the most active here uh, on West Texas. Brent is now 84.50. Uh, perhaps there's a line in the sand we can talk about there. Now, there's certainly news in, uh, in the Middle East and the latest here in Israel. Tanks have reached the center of Rafa, and the sign here, the military could be nearing, of course, its goal here of taking full control of that specific city. And the residents have been reporting clashes between uh, Israel and Hamas forces in, in the center of town, in fact. Uh, Bill Ferris is with us right now, uh, our senior editor, to talk us through this bill. Yes, yeah, so are, we, are we closer to um, an end here as far as Rafa is concerned here, as, based on our reporting so far? Well, uh, from what we know, we may be at the uh, what could be the beginning of the end. I think uh, you know Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has said uh, for many weeks now that he would send forces into Rafah, despite some of the condemnation he's gotten from overseas allies and other world leaders. Uh, he said that Israel has to do this to get the last remaining battalions of Hamas and the Hamas leadership that uh, he believes are holed up there in Rafah. So. Uh, what we know at the latest is that some Israeli forces, uh, ground troops, uh, tanks, have gotten into the center of Rafah. There appear to be some, uh, some clashes taking place. Uh, but whether uh, how close Israel is to its goal of, uh, of, of going against those larger battalions and getting the leadership, I think that, uh, that has still not happened. So uh, it's hard to say how close we are, but it's certainly uh, one of the final stages in terms of what Israel has laid out basically since the beginning of this conflict. Now, now, Bill, related to the story, on Sunday, we started out the week, of course, with a strike uh, on Sunday. And the, the, well, what's been the update there? And what's one part of the question? The second part is, has the White House now come out? And what have they said? Does that change anything as far as their support to Israel's concerns here, for Israel's concerns? Well, uh, yeah, so we've, we still are feeling the repercussions uh, from this strike on the, the tent refugee camp in Rafah. It killed at least uh, 45 civilians, including a number of women and children. That strike was condemned uh, around the world, uh, including by Israeli allies. And Prime Minister Netanyahu called it a tragic mistake that they are investigating. Uh, the Israeli military now is saying that based on the weapons they used uh, at that site, that their weapons weaponry could not have, uh, would not have likely started the fire that, that burned through a lot of the tents. Uh, they are raising the idea that possibly ammunition was being stored there. They've put forward what they say is some evidence that there was an ammo depot uh, among the refugees there. They've long said that Hamas uh, tries to hide, it, hide among the civilian population. Uh, it's still too early to, to know whether, that, uh, whether that's credible or not, uh, but they are saying that there were some confounding factors that probably probably made the situation worse. The White House has since come out and basically said that uh, they are really don't plan any policy changes, and that really means that they're not going to hold up more weapons shipments to Israel because of this latest incident. There was some uh, questions about whether uh, the attack on this tent camp uh, would have crossed one of the red lines that President Joe Biden had set out in terms of the invasion of Rafah. The White House so far indicating that it does not feel that way, that, uh, that Israel's incursions have been smaller scale than the kind of uh, mass incursion that it has uh, warned uh, Israel against undertaking there. Bill Ferries, our senior editor in Singapore for us. Uh, plenty more ahead here in shows. Uh, we'll have a closer look at what's taking place over in Japan. Of course, it's also about time of the day for our China Brief, so stay tuned for 
all those segments just ahead. This is Bloomberg. The Japanese government, and just a brief look at markets while we talk about this story, going into the story here. So the government is embarking on a major review of its energy strategy with a debate certainly heating up over the restarting of this uh, fleet of uh, mothballed and idle nuclear reactors. Now that could actually include the world's biggest nuclear power plant. Uh, it's operated by TEPCO, the company of course blamed for failing uh, to prevent the disaster in 2011 at its Fukushima uh, facility. Our Japan energy reporter Shoko Oda is with us right now to talk us through uh, this fairly consequential, globally consequential uh, if it does happen, of course, story. Yeah, Shoko, let's start with this. Why is this specific facility so important uh, for the Japanese government? Right, so it's a, a it's incredibly symbolic facility. Um, Kashiwazaki Kariwa is the last nuclear power plant that TEPCO owns. And of course, as you mentioned, TEPCO is the company responsible for the 2011 Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant disaster. And the Japanese government has been pushing proactively to use more atomic energy in the recent years. And so to them, if they're able to put nuclear back in the hands of the company that was responsible for and gain the public trust to um, restart this facility again, I think they see it as a, uh, a positive thing, as, a, a, as a something that could boost sentiment for use of more nuclear power moving forward. So I think they see it as a very critical piece of the puzzle. Okay, so let's maybe take a half a step back then now. So why, why the need or why the, the intention now of, of using or bringing back nuclear power to the power mix? So there's two, two large reasons why the Japanese government wants to use more nuclear. One is, of course, energy security. Japan is incredibly resource scant. Um, Japan imports a lot of its energy needs. And while it is trying to push for rollout of renewables, things like offshore wind projects could take uh, years to get them back online. So in the meantime, the Japanese government wants to use nuclear power as a way to curb um, dependency on imported fossil fuels. And then in the second reason is, of course, climate change. Um, Japan is heavily reliant on oil, gas, coal. Um, it relies 70% of its power on coal and gas plants. So by using these idled capacities, these nuclear power plants, the Jap Japanese government wants to um, make a step, wants to make progress on its decarbonization efforts. Right, and Shoka, why, why then this nuclear plant is getting attention today? And correct me if I'm wrong, weren't, didn't you go? Weren't you at, at this plant? Right, so there's been um, some development in, over the last few months um, in terms of why Kashiwazaki Kari was getting a lot of attention. Um, in December, the nation's regulator lifted the ban on the nuclear power plant from operating. And then in March, uh, the trade ministry, which oversees the energy policy for Japan, sent a high-ranking official to Niigata, that's where the nuclear power plant's located, to speak with the local governor and try to gain his understanding and his endorsement for restarting this nuclear power plant. And then along with that, TEPCO has also loaded um, the unit number seven of Kashiwazaki Kariwa with fuel to run some inspections. So there's been a lot of development that points toward, you know, steps, it's progressing that that restart is, could, could potentially be coming. Um, but of course, this, these things take a long time. It's a very political, politically, um, it's a politically sensitive issue. And there's no specific timeline for when the unit will restart at the moment. Shoko Oda our Japan energy reporter there on, uh, uh, certainly on this massive story. And of course, you can catch more on, on the Big Take, on today's Big Take and this specific one on the Big Take Asia podcast. And new episodes are dropping, of course, every Wednesday, which my brain reminds me is today. There we go. You can listen to this specific one on iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, and also on Spotify. Subscribers can also read more on Bloomberg's Big Take on the Terminal. Also on the Terminal 
is the price of the benchmark. We're down about six, seven tenths of one percent. What you don't see are volumes, and I'll tell you what volumes are doing. We're about 20, 21 percent below. So nothing is happening across these markets this Wednesday morning. This is Bloomberg. Here's a look at your China brief today. A look at. Uh... Oh, we're back on air. I guess we are, right? Okay, yes, we are. Okay, uh, look at your China brief today. Let's try to take three. There we go. So, People's Daily, Chinese President Xi Jinping pledging to make youth unemployment, or youth employment rather, a top priority is making the front page news here. The People's Daily quoting uh, President Xi is saying, high quality full employment is a key objective for the development of China. Almost 12 million Graduates are set to flood into the job market this year. That's 2% more than the number that we had back in 2023. Also on the front page here, on the front pages to be more specific, authorities are issuing regulations on uh, disciplinary actions against SOE managers. So the new measures standardize the type of behaviors actually deemed illegal and the punishments that will be applied to those behaviors. Now the regulations then take effect this coming September. Meanwhile, you have the Securities Daily says China's new special bond issuance accelerated in May with local governments selling about 100 notes, totaling almost 300 billion RMB. Uh, the focus of investments will be on things like transportation and also on infrastructure. Now, that goes into also what we're seeing in the property space and moves to shore up activity there. A reminder of some of the rescue measures we have seen out of China. And we should emphasize these are measures that have been announced, I think, in the last, just in the last day or so. So you have Shenyang coming out and scrapping their home buying curves. You have Shenzhen coming out and perhaps mulling, uh, converting some of these idled offices there into public housing. And earlier on, we had a report out of the Tianjin Daily that Tianjin City, which is, of course, the massive city next to Beijing, is also considering something along uh, those very lines. It goes into the property story and property moves we're seeing across these, these the equity markets as well. Have a look at some of these, uh, some of the equity names there as well. And we are seeing some, some upside right now in some of these names. Uh, across the yield space here in the Asia Pacific, so this bond bleed, Global bond yield is really filtering through across the region. We are seeing here on the back also of some CPI numbers coming through out of Australia, which were on the hotter side of things. We're now up 15 basis points today alone uh, on the Aussie 10 year yield. Uh, Japan 10 year yield now trading at 107. That's a new 2011 high. And the breaking news this hour on Samsung uh, Electronics. I'll leave you with this. So the we're now down 1.3%. This perhaps, and we need more details on this, could have more implications broadly on production wise. The labor union just announced this hour that it will stage a strike for the first time. That's it from us here on The China Show. Bloomberg Markets Asia is next. This is Bloomberg.